Welcome. This paper is going to focus on the question of straight edge punk opposed to anarchist movement as part of the consideration of the crisis between punk and anarchism. Straight edge punk emerged in Washington DC in 1981 through a 46 second song by the hardcore punk band Minor Threat. The song was entitled Straight Edge. It was penned by Ian McKay as both a personal statement of lifestyle choice and an angry accusation of the punk scene around him. He was angry that musicians were showing up to perform drunk and or high, which he called a fucking insult to the music and the audience. Music was sacred to him and intimately bound up with purpose, politics and protest. The song advocates a lifestyle of abstinence from alcohol, drugs and the pursuit of sex as a conquest. It became unintentionally a simultaneous rallying cry and a personal creed for what is now estimated to be tens of thousands of straight edge punks worldwide. Straight edge emerges at a time of crisis. It occurs at a time when punk is moving from first wave into different more fractured iterations such as UK82, ska punk, hardcore and anarcho punk. It occurs at a time, I would argue, in which punk is moving from being a moral panic to becoming a commodified object. And it occurs at a time of global crisis. The Cold War, the troubles in Northern Ireland, the Lebanese Civil War, the Falklands War and a global economic recession. While some elements of punk had not been shy about addressing politics and current events within their lyrics, that political stance came under closer scrutiny, especially for those claiming anarchism as their ideology or framework. The relationship between anarchism and punk is often assumed to be a lot more stable and obvious than it has actually ever been. Not all punks are anarchists, not all anarchist punks, and not all anarchist punks are the same type of anarchism. These are multifaceted entities who do not always easily align. There was a, a range of responses to the more vocal articulation of anarchism within punk lyrics and by various bands, fans and activists. Some anarchists rejected it outright as a lifestyle. Others understood what George McKay refers to as music's capacity to go beyond a bearer of political values into being a means of organisation. Some anarchists may have seen it as a powerful tool or even an invigorating force. Perhaps the most powerful um, embracing of the relationship was in understanding the importance and centrality of DIY. Raymond Patton probably takes the significance of that further than most when he argues that punk's DIY networks eroded the boundaries and political categories that defined the Cold War era, replacing them with a new framework based on identity as conservative or progressive. Through this paradigm shift, punk unwittingly ushered in a new era of global neoliberalism. If Patton's Right, if this is true, then punk is currently facing a crisis of its own making. This presentation will focus on the relationship between straight edge and anarchism based on my current research. It will give a brief overview of the interaction between the two and then explore if straight edge is an iteration of punk that lies outside of the more commonly written about relationship, um, specifically anarcho punk. It will do this by asking if straight edge is a form of post-anarchism or individualist anarchism before drawing some early conclusions and pointing to some interesting findings that are emerging from the ethnography I'm currently doing amongst Northern Ireland's straight edge punk scene. Of all the iterations of punk, straight edge is arguably the one that has the least visible connection with anarchism. Within straight edge, there can be a strong conservatism that manifests in ways that are seemingly antithetical to anarchist values or approaches. This is particularly true of those involved with the hardline aspect compared to what is called the positive aspect. Hardline arose to prominence during the 90s, and particularly in the USA. Hardline is often criticised for self-righteous militancy, a reductionist focus on animal rights and environmental issues, and an ethical fundamentalism that at its very worst forms resembles reactionary Christian doctrines, specifically condemnation of premarital sex, abortion and homosexuality. And you can see this in these interview extracts. I intentionally don't read out interview into extracts, so I'll just be quiet and let you read these. Being quiet, I, I want you to hear them in their own voices. So whilst this is only one faction of straight edge, it is a significant reason for the scepticism and ridicule that it has faced from other punks, anarchists and radical activists. Straight edge is also often criticised for being dominated by white male adherents who are less open to queerness and disability than some other aspects of punk. While we do have to be careful not to make blanket assumptions about participants, we must also be careful not to overstate the presence and experiences of marginalised groups within the subculture. <laughs> 
as these interview extracts highlight. The stance of abstinence from drugs and alcohol is the most common aspect of straight edge that interviewees would describe in terms that could be understood as aligned with anarchist ideologies. Drug and alcohol have been complicit in the subjugation of a number of groups whose freedom positive straight edgers typically support or advocate for, specifically animals, women, minority groups and queer individuals. However, these connections can be overplayed and the most common reasons for abstinence is generally a combination of breaking family cycles of addiction and abuse and as an anti-capitalist anti-government stance. For the latter, interviewees would often assert a Marxist notion that capitalism relies upon a numb populace buying products through the selling of their labour. Thus, alcohol and drugs become both a product of consumption and the means of maintaining a state in which further consumption is undertaken or even desirable. Some would speak of the role of alcohol and drugs as supporting a government they saw as ranging from undesirable to illegitimate. with the most common description being that of corrupt. And again, some interview quotes. A belief in freedom is key to understanding straight edge, but it is a freedom that is understood as constantly under threat through the promise of another freedom in inverted commas. A freedom from awareness, from critical thinking, and from emotional authenticity that is offered through intoxication. This was the crisis they perceived at the, punk of, at the core of punk writ large, and in part they responded by pushing back against that, by rejecting that such actions make one a punk. Individualised responsibility and accountability became their markers of resistance. That has held resonance for some for almost 40 years. Does this therefore make straight edge punk a post-anarchist punk movement, a Foucauldian decisive will not to be governed? Before starting this half of the presentation, I want to be clear that although I'm providing a comparative approach to this, I'm doing so for the sake of ease over a virtual presentation. I agree strongly with Jim Donoghue, who notes the relationship between anarchism and punk goes beyond a comparative similarity to a salient connection between punk scenes and anarchist movements. The term post-anarchism originated in Hakim Bey's 1987 essay of the same name. I am not engaging with or using his work, given his use of it to support and promote pedophilia. Post-anarchism is, is probably best understood as a fluid assemblage of political concepts that settle around two key principles, indifference to power and the will to freedom. Following Foucault, post-anarchism seeks to challenge the idea that power can be understood as all bad, or something that can be abolished, instead arguing that it is coextensive with every social form, and that it is always only grounded in its own historical contingency. Saul Newman argues that the radical force of post-anarchist theory lies in the contention that freedom is the ontological basis for all power, and in the insight that we are free to think and act different, as if no power, as if power no longer existed. Newman doesn't deny that there are still consequences and effects of power that impact upon individuals, but in my view, I don't think he nuances this enough to acknowledge the significant differences that one experiences as very real consequences. Um, and effects of power if one is part of a marginalised community or identity. Newman dismisses classical anarchism as fixated upon class and state, positing instead that post-structuralist political theory enables post-anarchism to be refracted as collective localised forms of resistance with radicalised subjectivity. Todd May echoes this and notes that its emphasis on self-determination over political representation makes post-structuralist-led post-anarchism more anarchist than traditional anarchist theory. Shariah Evan and Dwayne Roussel situate post-anarchism as an activist practice rather than solely an ideology. They draw upon Deleuze and Guthrie's rhizomatic to engage with what they term as new activism and resistance practice that give new understandings to power, subjectivity and creativity. It is worth noting, as Sandra Jepsen does, that most of the prominent proponents of post-anarchist uh, thought are white male Eurocentric writers who draw on other white male Western European philosophers, which is problematic in my view, given that a, a major component of their critique of classical anarchism is that it fails to include and engage with marginalized communities. 
what I would argue they're doing is using white male Eurocentric scholars to present as new what black female scholars have been doing for decades. See, for example, the works of anarchist scholars Zoe Zamuda, Ariane Kamba and Diane E, and black labour historians Patricia Hill Collins, Anthea Butler and Keisha Bling. So what about straight edge? Can we legitimately talk of straight edge as a post-anarchist movement? Certainly as a music-based subculture that grounds a significant portion of its activism and political engagement through the arts, it has a meaningful collection, connection with the events of May 68 in France, which post-anarchism traces its roots to culturally and philosophically. Many interviewees understood their absence as not only key to their identity, but as a form of resistance to a social norm of over-drinking. And a subculture that became deeply connected and dependent upon alcohol and drugs. Straight edge punks tend to understand inebriation as a, a form or tool of oppression and thus remaining sober as a means of challenging the effectiveness of that tool and potentially creating a better community. This aligns with the emphasis of self-determination, something that interviewees often discussed and, and even as you can see in these quotes. Yeah, there is an interesting element of straight edge that belies this, which is that of conformity and community. Straight edge is predicated upon community that is very problematically constructed as masculine, white, often but not always middle class and young, not unlike punk itself. The one thing that adherents have in common is voluntary adherence to a code that means they conform, at least on the surface, with middle class Christian behavioural codes. No alcohol, no drugs, restricted sex. It makes it very difficult to do anything but operate in comfort zones that suit the dominant institutions and power structures that exist within wider society. These interview quotes with female identifying straight edge punks in Northern Ireland demonstrate how problematic that can be. Ultimately, whilst they have some commonality with post-anarchism, straight edge punks are not actually doing anything with either post-structuralism or even anarchism that is relevant to the lives of the most oppressed people, to, to directly quote Otto Nunes. Their language, even the language of their activism, remains very much embedded within privilege and power, sometimes willfully so, sometimes in a very unaware way. This is something I, I'm really happy to take up in more detail in, in the live question section. We move to the question then, is straight edge a form of individual anarchism? In 1911, Emile Armand noted that to be an anarchist is to deny authority and reject its economic cholera exploitation in all of the domains where human activity is exerted. For Armand, as others, this meant living or the desire to live without gods, masters, directors, patrons, laws, prejudice and collective moral codes. Therefore, the individual anarchist places at the base of all conceptions of life, the individual act. This is the type of individualist anarchist that is more associated with the amoral self-serving rationality of egoism put forward by Stirner. Although various strands exist within this type of anarchism, what they share in common is the focus on the individual rather than the collective. The reject rejection of revolution in favour of slow evolutionary change and an understanding that the relationships that one builds are only ever transitory and for one's own benefit. Given the importance of Enlightenment era ideas and writings from people like William Goldman, who didn't believe in the equality of all people, it's important to acknowledge that individualist anarchism is shaped at its core by thinking that was exclusive. At the time, black people were not considered people but property. Colonial subjects were little above that and women were subject to the rule of men and often legally the property of their husbands or fathers. Surprisingly, given their core commitment to community, what they call scenes, there are still strength, strong links with individualist anarchism that straight edge, within straight edge that bear drawing out and reflecting upon. It is worth noting that on the whole, relationships are deeply important to the subculture. I have not yet had a single interviewee. I've interviewed almost 130 people. And I haven't had a single interviewee who has not spoken passionately of relationships with others as key to their longevity within straight edge. I intentionally study those who remain straight edge outside of their teens and early 20s, so I never interview anyone under the age of 25. 
Building upon that, straight edge has a strong understanding of living beings as having worth beyond labour and self-interest, and few would deny the humanity of another person. Although, as I have already mentioned, there are hardline individuals who are deeply racist, sexist, homophobic and ableist, or some combination thereof. However, the, the equality um, that I'm speaking of is often arrived at within straight edge, not through interacting with other people, but through animal rights activation and, and liberation. One interview in particular tracked that really cogently uh, within his interview. That all said, an argument can be made that in claiming edge, in abstinence, the individual is championed over the collective. To make such a claim necessitates straight, seeing straight edge within a wider punk umbrella. A lot of the coherency of punk is through shared experiences, especially a live music show or event. That often includes alcohol and drugs. A part of punk was to push boundaries, challenge accepted social norms and mores, and again the use of alcohol and drugs is a part of that. Punk was attractive to the outcast, to the out one, the unwanted, the disenfranchised, and the reality is that often, though not always, such people carry with them trauma. The ease of access to drugs and alcohol makes for a temporary cognitive and or emotional relief from that trauma. Therefore, to elect a life of abstinence is to reject all of that and the community that comes with it. It is what one of my interviewees described as outpunking punk. In these cases, straight edgers have often willingly and knowingly chose the individual over the community of punk more broadly. But in doing so, they find out or help to shape the straight edge community, which gives them, in their own terms, family, brotherhood, belonging, a crew, my people, and home. These were the different words that they used. The other area of strong compatibility is that of evolution over revolution. Straight edge punks, on the whole, favour a slow evolution of change modelled by their own behaviour with al alcohol, drugs, and sex. This is particularly noticeable with regards to veganism. Despite some of the most vehement vegan and animal rights bans, such as Vegan Right, Earth Crisis, Destroy Babylon, XBX, being located within Straight Edge, they seldom, if ever, call for direct action in the way that bands such as Conflict do. Instead, veganism is seen not as a matter of personal purity, but rather rooted in a strong belief in animal rights and a means of personally rejecting the exploitation of animals. Straight Edge punks tend to focus more on personal responsibility and focus less on confronting systemic issues within society. That said, I have noticed in my most recent interview, uh, interviews, which I've been undoing since 2017, a marked difference amongst Northern Irish straight edge punks, specifically women and those who describe themselves as female identifying. They are pushing to di directly confront and change systemic issues in society. They are expressing themselves in ways that are more aligned with anarcho-syndicalism. I'm currently working on trying to figure out why this gender divide is, has occurred, and especially why it has occurred in Northern Ireland and what that might mean for straight edge punk more, more broadly. These interview extracts give you just a sense of the change of language and approach that I'm seeing. So to draw this to a conclusion, straight edge punk is an intentional response to a perceived crisis within punk that is partially linked with punk's complicated relationship to anarchism. Via the anarchist battle cry, neither God nor master, most closely aligned to the anarcho-punk tradition, an anti-establishment sentiment permeated through much of the growth of punk. But it has not been a well-articulated or fully understood sentiment. Often it is assumed to exist where it does or did not. It is fair to say that straight edge is one of the most inarticulate areas of punk when it comes to anarchism. As the paper has demonstrated, there are elements within it that both align it to and simultaneously see it reject, both post-anarchism and individualist anarchism. Straight Edge, more than most other punk scenes or iterations, is the one that is closest to white Protestantism. Not necessarily Christianity per se, although that connection certainly exists. Um, we see that in the work of Abraham, 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 
Consequently, Straight Edge is the punk scene in which we find the least articulated notion of anarchism. And yet interviewees were grappling very seriously with how to reconcile Straight Edge with the Neither God Nor Master Creed, which is what these final two extracts are from. Um, and with that, I would like to close the presentation. Thank you.